the term existentialism was coined about 30 years ago, initially mainly to refer to a couple of German philosophers about whom I shall talk hardly at all in the series of three lectures, namely Karl Jaspers and Martin Heidegger. It was, however, only after World War II that through the writings of the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, existentialism became very well known and very much talked about all over the world and quite especially in the United States too. Although there is a good deal of interest in it and it's very much discussed, there's no complete agreement about just what existentialism means, about just what it refers to. It might be foolish for me to say here is what exactly it means, but it is surely essential for me if I want to give three lectures about it to tell you how I am going to use the term. I'm going to use it as a label to refer to a number of people who are usually meant by the term, and these would be quite particularly Søren Kierkegaard and Heidegger and Jaspers and Jean-Paul Sartre. I'll say something about Nietzsche in a few minutes, seeing that the second lecture will be largely devoted to Nietzsche. Now, why use the term existentialism as such a label, instead of using the word, rather giving a clear-cut definition of it? There's one existentialist who tried to give a definition of it. Sartre said that existentialism was the doctrine that teaches that existence precedes essence. There are a number of things that are bad about this definition. The first one is, and this in itself isn't crucial, that it's terribly unclear that it's even harder to understand what it means that existence precedes essence than it's to understand, quite apart from that, what existentialism might be. The second reason for not accepting this definition, which after all perhaps could be explained, is that no sooner had Sartre said that in a lecture, existentialism is a humanism, then Heidegger published a letter on humanism in which he said, if that's existentialism, I'm not an existentialist. And along came Jaspers and said, count me out too. <laughs> and if we look back, for example, to Kierkegaard, for example, to Nietzsche, or if we take a sidelong glance at Camus, it seems clear that these other men would not accept this particular definition either. Now one might see, is there some other definition that we can impose on the lot of them? And it doesn't seem to me to be a particularly fruitful undertaking. We might perhaps later in this course of lectures look back afterwards and see whether some one definition comes to mind. Meanwhile, I don't have a bad conscience at all about just using it as such a label. There are any number of other labels that we use in a similar way. For example, when we speak of American pragmatism, what are we doing but simply using some sort of shorthand device to refer all at once to Peirce and James and Dewey, perhaps also to Mead, perhaps also to one or another person who comes to mind. But we don't work with any very clear-cut definition, and if we happen to be close students of any two of these men, say of James and Dewey or of James and Peirce, then the more we read them, the more we become aware of the fact that they really don't agree with each other at all, that there are very important points on which they disagree with each other. And still it's useful sometimes to discuss them together because there are some family resemblances between them. There are certain ways in which they belong recognizably together rather than belong with other groups. Similarly, when we speak of continental rationalists, as we sometimes do in philosophy courses, then we mean Descartes and Spinoza and Leibniz, and as we study them, we find that they violently disagreed with each other on points that mattered deeply to them. 
I'll just give one more such examples, example, namely British empiricism. Another such label, it refers to Locke, Barclay, and Hume. And if we examine them closely, we find, for example, that Locke was a deist, that Barclay was a bishop, and that Hume was, to be polite about it, an agnostic. So there were certainly very many things about which these three disagreed with each other, and they criticized each other, and still there are some things that Locke, Barclay, and Hume sort of seem to have in common, even if it's a little difficult to say what precisely it is, and that distinguishes them from the rationalists or from the pragmatists. So there's nothing unusual about using the term existentialism as a label for a group of people and then sort of as an afterthought asking ourselves, now what are the traits that they have in common? Now the traits that they have in common are, first of all, that the men that we usually call existentialists are all of them very radical individualists. And this is what makes it so hard to pin them all down to a common platform. They're all men who have very much a mind of their own and to make a point of going it alone. In fact, part of whose common outlook is that there is something wrong with schools of philosophy, that there is something wrong with drafting some kind of a platform, that there is something wrong with philosophic systems. They are people who, in a phrase that Nietzsche once used in Zarathustra, like only what a man has written with his blood. In other words, stuff that doesn't come from the brain alone, but rather stuff in which a man is engaged as an entire personality with all his experience. This is the sort of thing they like. And if a man tries to transpose into prose all of his experience, then seeing that his experience and his character is bound to be different from somebody else's, there will be a distinctive individual quality to his writing which distinguishes him from the other men. And so, as we take up in these three lectures, three different men, we will find that everyone has very much a style of his own and a character of his own and a mode of thinking of his own. Positively, we can say that one further thing that they have in common is a concern with extreme situations, extreme experiences, the most intense experiences, the most extraordinary experiences, and in the narrower sense, we might say the less happy experiences. And it's in a narrower sense, this leaves out to some extent Nietzsche, who is certainly a borderline figure, a very doubtful candidate for existentialism. What he has in common with the other existentialists is that he too is particularly interested in ultimate experiences, but unlike most of the other existentialists, he does not emphasize so exclusively, to cite the titles of some of Kierkegaard's books, Fear and Trembling, and the sickness unto death which is despair, and the concept of dread, and going beyond Kierkegaard now, the experience of the anticipation in thought of one's own death. On the whole, the existentialists are particularly preoccupied with the gloomier experiences, but at any rate, with the most dramatic, with the most tragic experiences. This, of course, in large measure, accounts for the intelligent person's interest in existentialism and accounts for the fact that even people who find most current philosophy not particularly interesting feel that when it comes to existentialism, there is something here that's of concern to them because existentialists do talk about experiences about which it is difficult to be indifferent experiences that matter to all of us and that engage our interest if they are written about with any sensitivity and intelligence at all. What is implicit in what I have said so far is that if the question is raised, for example, was Pascal an existentialist? 
or was Albert Camus an existentialist? There is no right or wrong answer here. All we can say is, well, there are certain things that these men have in common with people usually called existentialists, and then we can see are there also some things that, distingu that distinguish them from the other existentialists? In what respects are they like other members of the family? In what respects are they different? Certainly we must not make up our minds on the basis of whether they like each other. It so happens that most of the living existentialists dislike each other quite intensely, but that happens in some families too, and that's no proof that somebody doesn't belong to the family. On the contrary, precisely people who have much in common with each other and who have inherited some of the same traits sometimes find each other particularly trying. And that applies to existentialists too. A further implication of what I have said is that it would not be proper to say that existentialism is a synonym for modern philosophy. There are some modern philosophers, especially French and German ones, though not only French and German ones, who are existentialists, but there are also many other modern philosophers, including most modern English-speaking philosophers, who are not existentialists. The existentialists are those who share these traits that I have talked about, who are so individualistic, who are impatient with things that are remote from life, who deal with dramatic experiences. Now, how shall we relate existentialism to what I have called the modern crisis? That there are all sorts of crises in our time is surely not controversial. Unquestionably, our time is a time of crisis. But I do not mean to imply right from the start, without having examined the matter at all, that our time is uniquely a time of crisis. About this I would like temporarily to suspend judgment. So if one or the other of you should feel that perhaps every time is a time of crisis, or at least that there have been many other times that have been just as critical as our time, we needn't uh, argue about this at all. We needn't have any difference about this at all. All that I want to say is that there are some crises in our time, and what I want to do is to relate existentialism to three such crises in our time, the one in religion, today, the one in philosophy next week, the one in morality two weeks from today, and then we can see each time to what extent each of these three crises is uniquely modern, or to what extent it is perhaps a perpetual crisis. Now why do I pick out the three men that I have picked out? Kierkegaard for today, Nietzsche for next week, and Sartre for two weeks from tonight. First of all, there are strong reasons for beginning with Kierkegaard, because he is the first unquestionable existentialist. He is the one who started the whole modern movement of existentialism, even though now in retrospect we can look further back and find existentialist features in the thought of Pascal or even St. Augustine or as some people would like to do all the way back in the book of Job. Still, as a philosophic and literary movement, existentialism starts with Kierkegaard. Moreover, Kierkegaard is undoubtedly one of the most commanding and impressive figures of existentialism, and I think of the religious existentialists probably the most remarkable. So he is, to my mind, a particularly good and I would say obvious choice for discussing religious existentialism. The international renown of existentialism is largely due to Jean-Paul Sartre, 
And I would say that if we look at literary representatives of existentialism, Sartre is probably the outstanding one, the one who in brilliant novels, short stories, plays, and essays, as well as philosophic treatises, has brought existentialism to our attention. And here too, in the case of Sartre, just as in the case of Kierkegaard, I am influenced by my considerable respect for the man. Nietzsche was not, as I have already remarked, strictly speaking, in the narrow sense of the word, an existentialist. But I think a good case can be made out for saying that he towers very far indeed above such philosophers as Jaspers and Heidegger, perhaps even to the extent of being the last world historical philosopher, by which I mean that since Nietzsche's time, philosophers have not had a really international impact. A man like Sartre, a man like Jaspers, a man like Heidegger has had very little impact on English-speaking philosophy. On the other hand, the giants of English-speaking philosophy, people like Russell and Moore and John Dewey and William James, have had hardly any impact in the non-English-speaking world on continental European thought. Nietzsche is, I think, the last great philosopher in whom we find impulses and tendencies that have been influential and crucially important for philosophy almost everywhere. So I pick him too because he seems to me to be of unusual stature. To wind up then these introductory remarks, I would say that I happen to be, as some of you know, critical of existentialism, but the point of this series of three lectures will not be to tear down existentialism. It will not be to try to show how foolish it all is. And that is why I have picked three men to whom in various ways, although I am critical of them here or there, I do look up. And what I want to do is to try to increase your understanding as best I can, not only of these three men, but also of existentialism, and beyond that, of some aspects of the modern world, of three crises in particular, of issues that concern all of us, and perhaps here and there I may be able to make some constructive suggestions. Now let us begin with Kierkegaard. I propose to approach him somewhat differently from the way he is usually approached. I think he himself would have said that the usual approach to his thought is, in his own peculiar use of that word, aesthetic. When Kierkegaard speaks of an aesthetic approach, or an aesthetic orientation, what he means is that one is a spectator, that one looks at something that is outside oneself, that one observes without becoming involved in it. An extreme form of an aesthetic attitude would be if you collapse in front of your TV set and just try to be entertained. But that would not be the only example of an aesthetic attitude. The attitude would remain aesthetic, the way Kierkegaard uses the term, as long as you make no commitment, as long as you yourself do not become deeply involved. And I dare say that most current interpretations of and most current interest in Kierkegaard is of this aesthetic nature, that he is a terribly interesting person. Being interesting would be, in Kierkegaard's peculiar use of the term, an aesthetic category. It's interesting, it's fascinating, just look at it. Secondly, people usually look at Kierkegaard by way of pointing out that he was very critical of the German philosopher Hegel, 
And since there's hardly anybody who is not very critical of Hegel, if he talks about Hegel at all, this too is not very distinctive. To say he is interesting, to say he hates Hegel's guts, this really doesn't set him apart. Almost everybody does. Thirdly, people usually present Kierkegaard as if he had been something of an apologist either an apologist for Christianity or preferably a sort of non-denominational apologist for religion, somebody who sort of fits into the current scene as one of the many people who are, of course, as who is not in favor of religion. In all three respects, my approach to Kierkegaard is very different. First of all, it's not aesthetic, but existential. Instead of just saying, now, isn't he a beautiful writer? Doesn't he put things quaintly? Isn't this a nice book? I will say, isn't this a maddening book? Isn't this something that is meant to upset us? Kierkegaard uses deliberately the uh, word that is found in the epistles of Paul, scandalon, a scandal, a stumbling block, an outrage, something that is upsetting. Kierkegaard wants to upset us, and I will try to emphasize elements in his thought that are upsetting. This takes me to the second point. Instead of claiming that he criticized Hegel, which he certainly did, I will say that he criticized Hegel and Hegelianism because philosophers in his time, for the most part, were Hegelians, but that he really criticized philosophy quite generally, and that if he had lived in our time, instead of picking on poor old Hegel, I'm sure he would have picked on pragmatism, or he would have picked on uh, logical positivism, or analytic philosophy, any kind of philosophy, indeed beyond philosophy, he would have criticized our trust in reason, our trust in science. This is something that is, to the modern mind, somewhat outrageous, but this is something that has to be brought out. And finally, very far from being an apologist for Christianity or for religion, somebody who tries to make it palatable, Kierkegaard wore himself out in trying to denounce people who sought to make religion and Christianity in particular palatable and insisted that it is not palatable but that it is absolutely absurd, that it's outrageous to the human reason, that it might even outrage our moral sense and that nevertheless it should be accepted. In other words, his conception of religion, once it is understood, I think, is seen not to fit at all into the current revival of religion, but on the contrary, Kierkegaard, if he were living today, I'm sure, would be a particularly outspoken and radical critic of the kind of religion that is flourishing today. And this wants to be brought out if one wants to do justice to the man who said of himself in what is perhaps one of the nicest passages of his writings, that when he was about 30, one day he sat in the park and he said to himself, here I am 30 years old and what have I done? Very, very little. Here are so many great men in our time and they all have done so much and I have done so little. And then he thought about it and he decided that what all these men were doing to the best of their ability was to make life easier. And that he himself had no talent for making life easier and so he resolved to make things more difficult. I think that's a lovely passage in the concluding unscientific postscript, how Kierkegaard resolves to make things more difficult. And one doesn't do justice to him and his heritage if one talks about him for an hour in a lecture, if one doesn't bring out this crucial element that he is somebody who related himself to Socrates because he too wanted to be a gadfly, he too wanted to make things difficult. Now let me very quickly fill in some data about his life. He was born in 1813 and he died in 1855 and he lived almost all his life in Denmark, specifically in Copenhagen, though he briefly studied also at the University of Berlin. 
His father was a very strict and rigid authoritarian, a very pious man who was bothered by the fact that once when he had been very poor as a young boy, he had out on the heather cursed God. And this bothered not only the father, but it also bothered the son very deeply. Kierkegaard also remembers how his father wouldn't uh, allow him much to go outdoors, but said uh, there's no need to go outdoors. Perhaps this had something to do with the fact that the boy, Zuren Kierkegaard, was somewhat crippled, somewhat misshapen. Perhaps that was why the father didn't want him to go out too much. The father said, we can take a walk in this room. We can just walk up and down together. And as they walked up and down together for perhaps half an hour at a time, the father described what they saw. Castles in Spain, and he described them in such great detail, everything that they saw, and with such painstaking and vivid imagination that after about half an hour the boy was all worn out from so much experience and as exhausted as if he had been playing ball for hours. This greatly stimulated his imagination, but also made him something very peculiar, somewhat solipsistic, somebody who could sort of after a while just stay by himself and imagine all sorts of things without ever actually coming into contact with other people. Then one day it seemed to the young boy that there was strong evidence that his father had seduced his mother before they were married, when the father's first wife had died and when the second wife-to-be was still a maid in his house, and that he, Zuren Kierkegaard, was probably begotten before his father and mother were married, and when he found this out, he was so shocked because his father had seemed such a pious and such a moral man that it would seem that just once he debauched himself, he went to a brothel, something of that sort, and then afterwards kept thinking about the relation between the sins of the fathers and the sins of the children, as somehow the father's sin was connected, as it obviously was psychologically in his case, with the sin of the son, who when he finds out about the father's sin, does something himself that is sinful, and this set him to brooding about original sin. Not that he wouldn't have thought about that anyway, but there was this vivid personal connection in, this, uh, in his mind. And then he became engaged to a young girl, a very young girl, Regina, and finally decided that he couldn't go through with a marriage, and he felt that he couldn't say to her, I ha have some kind of a call. I think marriage might interfere with the sort of things that I have to do. Or he couldn't say to her, being somewhat crippled, I feel that I just can't consummate our marriage. I, I, I don't really want to get married. He felt that he couldn't be frank with her because she was so young. He felt that he couldn't share these awful memories of what his father had done, what he had done with her. And so he felt that perhaps the only way of bringing this unhappy relationship to an end was to lead her to want to break off the engagement by seeming to be a terribly frivolous person, blackening his own character so that she would want to break off the relationship. And here I have given you the major events of his life. These relatively few experiences not in themselves perhaps really so terribly unusual, were for him fateful experiences that with an unusually sensitive soul he brooded over all his short life long and kept alluding to in one way or another in his many, many books. There are, I think, only two further episodes in his life to be added to round out the picture. 
One which I find particularly moving is that there was a paper in Copenhagen that praised him highly, that took a fancy to him. He was a brilliant writer, and a writer with a fine sense of humor, and a good stylist, and the paper praised him. And Kierkegaard despised this paper. And so he wrote the paper and said that he counted it a dishonor to be praised in its pages, and that in view of his opinion of this paper, he would much rather be pilloried by it. And the editor, perhaps understandably, took offense at this and ran in almost every issue horribly merciless cartoons of the misshapen, crippled Kierkegaard, making fun of him all the time until the children ran after him in the streets and threw rocks at him and laughed at him. But here you have a contempt for popularity and a contempt for the things that most people appreciate that I think requires a very profound respect. The other thing about his life that I still want to mention is that in the very end he came to the conclusion that the church of his country, which happened to be Lutheran, was so antithetical to what he took to be true Christianity and the heritage of Christ that he felt that one must openly protest against it. And so he privately printed pamphlets against the church, peddled them on the streets, collapsed in the street in the process of peddling them, was carried into a hospital where he lingered between life and death for a short while, refused to take the sacraments from an ordained minister of his church, said he would be willing to take them from a layman, but no layman was allowed to give him the sacraments. And so, although devoutly, intensely, passionately Christian, died without having taken the sacraments because he would not compromise with a church that he considered a betrayal of true religion. His books are exceedingly plentiful, and there's a point to be made about them. In the year 1843, for example, he published Either Or in two volumes, then in the same year, 18 edifying discourses, then in the same year, a book called Repetition, and then still in the same year, fear and trembling. You might think that having published more than five volumes in one year, that he might have rested up during the following year, but in 1844, he published his philosophical fragments, his concept of dread and another book. And in 1845, an enormous book, Stages on Life's Way. In, in 1846, his perhaps most ambitious work, Concluding Unscientific Postscript. In 1847, more edifying discourses and his great works of love. In 1848, he wrote a book that he didn't publish. In 1849, he published The Sickness Unto Death, as well as three other books and also completed two more books that he didn't publish that year and that were published posthumously, and so it went. Here was a man, in other words, who wore himself out writing what he had to say, who did not divide his energies among any other things, though he had taken a theological degree. He did not become a minister. He did not want to have any official connection with the church and just wrote, wrote, wrote at a feverish pace. Under the circumstances, it is perhaps not a carping criticism if I say that sometimes his writing is, leaves something to be desired from a philosophic point of view, that sometimes it is not as careful as it might be, that sometimes there are perhaps turns of phrase uh, that invite objections, that sometimes perhaps he contradicts himself, that sometimes one can find fault. 
After all, if one writes at such a pace, so many books, not just in one year, but year after year after year, it is obvious that not everything is polished and as well considered as it might be. It has often been said, rightly, that Kierkegaard engaged in what is called indirect communication. And what is usually meant by that is that most of the books that I have just mentioned were not published over the name of Søren Kierkegaard, but over the name of rather odd, usually Latin pseudonyms. They were published by people with outrageous names. It was always obvious, because these names were Latin, that they couldn't be the real people. But all Copenhagen in those days was discussing, were all these pseudonyms one and the same man, or were they all sorts of different people? And Kierkegaard added to the mystification by having some pseudonyms attack others. And there are cross-references in these books, and this tickled his sense of humor. He thought this was funny. It is mildly funny, and this is called indirect communication. I don't think that that is really the heart of Kierkegaard's indirect communication. This is something that one might explain to some extent psychologically. One might say, isn't this continuous with what I told you about these walks that he took with his father, that here he, all alone in one room, peopled the world the way Richard II does in prison. All the world's a stage for him. And here are all these characters, all his inventions, and they engage in fights, and on some points they agree, and on some they disagree. You might almost say, without being disrespectful, this perhaps is part of his pathology. This is something that's psychologically odd and interesting. But this, I think, is not the crucial part of his indirect communication. The crucial part of the indirect communication is that Kierkegaard's mode of expression is artistic, that instead of always writing edifying discourses, as he sometimes did, instead of always coming right out and preaching, he often does the sort of thing that a novelist or a playwright does, that a man like Sartre will do too, namely, who avails himself of the mode of literature, of the mode of art, to get across his ideas a little less directly than one would if one came right out and told the reader. There are other features of a style that I think there's no need to go into in any detail here. It is, I think, an exasperating style, an outrageous style, an offensive style, and means to be so. To retell the story that in Genesis takes less than one full page about how Abraham went out to sacrifice Isaac but then didn't, Kierkegaard takes a whole little book going over and over and over it again with variations. And he means to exasperate, he means to annoy, he means to upset, he does not mean just to entertain. In fact, that whole little book, Fear and Trembling, is directed against people who read Genesis and find it oh so interesting and oh so admirable and don't ask themselves, what would I say if a man came along in my time who said God has told me to sacrifice somebody else and I am about to do it. This is the problem that Kierkegaard says we must ask ourselves about. We mustn't say isn't it a beautiful story and how well written and uh, how concise in style and look how the emotions of father and son are caught so beautifully. That is an aesthetic approach. What Kierkegaard wants is the existential approach that asks, what would I do if I were in Abraham's shoes? What would I do if my next door neighbor said that he was in Abraham's shoes and went out to kill somebody else because he thought that God had told him to? Now, what about the crisis in religion to which I want to relate Kierkegaard? The crisis in religion in our time is so manifold 
that one could easily, obviously, give more than three lectures without even mentioning Kierkegaard just to analyze the crisis in religion. I will single out instead three aspects of the crisis in religion. One, because I think they are important, and two, because I think that Kierkegaard is interesting in relation to them. The first crisis in religion in our time, and I think perhaps the single most important point is one that may strike you at first as being such old hat that it's hardly worth talking about. And that is the way in which science has undermined what we might call naive religious beliefs. Now you, for the most part, may consider this terribly old hat because you may feel that the beliefs that have been undermined by science are so naive that you obviously don't have these beliefs anymore. But for a moment, do just recapitulate in your own mind the familiar enough story of how beginning, say, with Copernicus and going on to Galileo and to Darwin and to Freud, again and again science has come into conflict with religion and has forced religious people to reinterpret their beliefs, to revise their beliefs. The crisis is that after this reinterpretation has been going on for a few hundred years, suddenly the question emerges, what now do these beliefs mean? If they don't contradict science, it is no longer obvious what they mean. To say that God created the world is very understandable long as it contradicts some scientific theory or other. But if you say uh, it doesn't contradict any scientific theory, there's nothing that science could possibly find out that could conflict with the belief that God created the world, then it becomes questionable what it means to say that God created the world. And so with other religious beliefs. The big problem, I suppose, for religious belief in our time is no longer quite so much what's the evidence for them or what's the evidence against them, because most people probably have redefined in such a way that evidence is no longer very clearly relevant to them. And in that what now do these beliefs mean? Instead of dwelling further on this point, I will proceed to what I take to be the second and the third aspect of the crisis, then say what I think Kierkegaard had to say on each of these points, and then leave it to you in our question and answer period after the lecture to probe any particular aspect that especially interests you. The second great crisis in religion is of a moral nature. If somebody says and seriously means it, that whatever is in the Bible whether that be defined as the Hebrew Bible only or as the Old and New Testament both, that whatever is in the Bible is the word of God and that all the moral commandments to be found in the Bible are imposed on us by God, then we have what seems morally a clear position. But that is not what the modern religious believer says. But the people in the past have said quite that. I needn't go into right now. Here certainly we have an aspect of the religious crisis today that has his root, its roots through the centuries. That's not completely new today. I do think it's more acute today than it has been in the past. People select much more consciously and much more individually now than they have ever done in the past 
what commandments they recognize and what commandments they don't recognize. If you confront people with some commandment in the Bible that is contrary to their conscience, very few people, I think, are greatly disturbed by that anymore. They will just say, well, obviously that belongs to some uh, very ancient strata of the Bible. That's an old idea, it's a primitive idea. That doesn't go for us anymore. Well, where is the crisis? All this seems very fine. The crisis is that if you are the one who does the choosing and picking as to which commandments are still binding on you, then what is the relevance of God to morality? What is the relevance of religion to morality? Aren't in that case religious believers and agnostics and atheists all in the same boat? In that case they all find out what their morality is going to be, what their ethical code is going to be, by beginning with what they have been taught in the nursery, then revising that in the light of their own conscience, of their own experience, of their own reason, asking themselves more or less deliberately what stands up and what doesn't stand up under scrutiny, and then very much as an afterthought there's suddenly a difference between the religious person and the irreligious person, namely the religious person then suddenly says, and this of course I believe because the Bible says so. But to that extent, isn't the religious person deceiving himself? Is he really believing these things because the Bible says so? Apparently not, because there are other things in the Bible that he does not accept. Doesn't God then become redundant? Don't God and religion really, in that case, become irrelevant to life? And aren't they brought in in a way that is not entirely honest anymore? This is the moral dimension of the religious crisis. And the third aspect is even more obviously age-old and I think not particularly modern, but it has its application in the 20th century and particularly since World War II. You might say that there is in organized religion an inverse proportion of quantity and quality. The more people crowd the temples and the churches, the shallower does religion become. This is not anything new, but it is something that's vividly illustrated in our time since World War II. But it is an old story, it's something that you find in the Hebrew Bible again and again and again, that uh, the prophets are not greatly cheered by the fact that temple attendance is up higher than ever, that people are trampling the courts. On the contrary, this they find rather disgusting. They don't say, well, this is wonderful, there are more sacrifices now than there used to be. Now all we need is that we put in God we trust on our coins or something of that sort, or if we had postage stamps that we cancel them, pray for peace. But what the prophets are concerned about is the terrible loss of quality of religion. And the prophets have a term for this, the remnant shall return, the idea that deep religion, genuine religion, is perhaps possible only for small groups. But this is an old idea. The idea, if you want to put it somewhat aggressively, which is appropriate if we want to connect this in a moment with Kierkegaard, that perhaps organized religion is something of a cancer, something that proliferates without aim and threatens to kill genuine religiousness. This may not be, this need not be, all there is to organized religion, but this is the awful danger of it. This is a perpetual crisis, and if we think about our time rather than thinking about biblical times, perhaps the last two very great religious figures who protested against the churches and against organized religion in the name of a religious vision of their own 
were Leo Tolstoy, who was excommunicated by the Greek Orthodox Church, and Søren Kierkegaard, who in a kind of a way broke with his own church. Now, if we then relate Kierkegaard to the crisis in religion, he is easiest to relate to this last point. He denounces organized religion, not necessarily in principle. He doesn't say there shouldn't be churches, but he thinks that the churches that exist in his own time in Denmark in the 1840s and 50s somehow don't come up to scratch at all. And if we look at what he criticizes the churches in his own country in the 19th century for, it is quite clear that his criticisms also apply at least as much, if not more, to the churches in our time. It is interesting in that connection that what he would like the churches to do is to be much more authoritarian he attacks them because they don't lay down the law to people because they are too liberal. But surely the same would apply to our churches today, which more or less take the attitude that as long as you go to any church or temple or something of the sort, it's all right that any religious faith will do, no matter what it is, that one ought to have some faith in some organized religion or other, and let me be blunt, not take it too seriously. If you think that I'm myself not entirely serious about this, let me give an illustration that, uh, even if you should find it mildly ridiculous, will bring out how dead serious I am about it. I don't think that the people of the United States today would stand for a presidential candidate who would not be affiliated with some organized religion. They do want their candidates to have some ties to some organized religion. But if Mr. Kennedy said, I take my Roman Catholicism seriously, he'd be through. And if Mr. Nixon were really a Quaker, instead of saying, I am in favor of fighting, then he would be through. What they want is a Quaker who is no Quaker and a Roman Catholic who is no Roman Catholic. It's in this sense that our revival of religion is an organized religion is in a way a very shallow and misleading thing that has very little to do with deep religiousness. The person who is deeply religious would get into trouble in the United States today and certainly couldn't be elected to high office any more than the person who is openly atheistic. It's more complicated if we try to relate Kierkegaard to the other process. But still, something can be said about these two. What about his attitude toward the meaning of religious beliefs when they no longer come into conflict with science? Kierkegaard's answer here is clear. He thinks that religious beliefs do conflict with science, that they must not be reinterpreted in such a way that they won't conflict with science. He thinks that religious beliefs, and the particular religious beliefs in which he is interested, those of Christianity, as he understands it, are, to use the word that he uses again and again, absurd. It's Kierkegaard who introduced this word absurd into the vocabulary of existentialism, though it may be possibly more familiar to many of you from the writings of Albert Camus. No, religious beliefs, he thinks, are, Christian beliefs, are to reason absurd, and one must accept them nevertheless. One must humbly accept what one cannot comprehend. And one must oppose critical thinking. And one must be unscientific. And one must denounce science. One could go into great detail here and quote any number of texts in Kierkegaard, and if there should be any demand for that in the discussion period, I'm willing to do so. 
But uh, I would also suggest, if you are willing, some of you, to do some reading on Kierkegaard, that you will find a good deal of material if you will read, let us say, at least two things, Kierkegaard's own book, Fear and Trembling, and perhaps by way of rounding out my lecture, to find information that I did not put into this lecture because it's available in print, chapter 10, the chapter on Kierkegaard in my book From Shakespeare to Existentialism, a book incidentally that on the little folder that you got is credited to Miss Hazel Barnes. But I in the bargain was credited with a much bigger book, namely her The Literature of Possibility, uh, which is published by the University of Nebraska. That is one mistake in this little bibliography. The last item there is Miss Barnes, and the one directly above that is mine. Both those books, Fear and Trembling and My From Shakespeare to Existentialism, are available in paperback. And by reading Fear and Trembling and uh, my chapter on Kierkegaard, you will get a much fuller picture of Kierkegaard than you will just from this lecture alone. What about the moral selection? Here it is Kierkegaard's point that you have no right whatsoever to make any moral selection. You should not do that. That if God should tell you to sacrifice your own son, to commit murder, <clears throat> you have no right to say this cannot be God because this is contrary to conscience. Because if you do that, then God is reduced to a mere redundancy. Then you don't need God at all. Then you take the name of the Lord in vain by just introducing him afterwards to sanction what you believe anyway. No, you must countenance the possibility, if your religion is at all meaningful, here, you must countenance the possibility that, re that religion may not only outrage your reason, but your conscience too. A very profound point, I think, for every religious person to ponder, whether if he does not countenance the possibility that God might go against conscience, God is not truly irrelevant to morality altogether. If conscience is supreme, then why do you need God in morality? If, on the other hand, you take God seriously in ethics, then there's the possibility that he might possibly go against conscience. Now, in conclusion, we're confronted with the oddity that if we consider what Kierkegaard has to say on these three aspects of the crisis, you will find him, very probably, unacceptable on at least two of the three points, perhaps on all three. Probably some of you will sympathize with his attitude toward organized religion, though some others of you will feel that it's too extreme. Probably very few of you will agree with him that religion ought to overrule reason and that one ought to believe things that are absurd. And perhaps, I don't know, none of you or hardly any of you will agree that religion could or should go against conscience. Is Kierkegaard then really just an outrageous fellow who has very strange and bizarre ideas which after all are just interesting but who doesn't really have much to say to us. That is not my view. I think that on all three of these points, he deserves terribly serious consideration. One can, on all three points, obviously, accept pretty much what he says if one then draws the conclusion that religion is to be rejected for that very reason. He is much more of a thorn in the flesh and meant to be for the religious believer. But let me conclude this lecture by bringing out three points on which he seems to me to be particularly worthwhile. Number one, we find in Kierkegaard and particularly in that very difficult and abstruse book, The Sickness Unto Death, which comes together with fear and trembling in the same paperback volume, complete and unabridged, 
We find him saying in that that almost all men are in despair, whether they know it or not, the one exception being the true Christian, if there should be any true Christian today. Now this at first plan seems meaningless. Does it make any sense to say that somebody is in despair but he doesn't know it? This seems very strange. It seems as if he didn't know how to use language. Here you can try to defend him in two ways. The first way of defending him would be, uh, if I may say so, the theological way, namely you redefine the terms. And this Kierkegaard does, sort of in passing, but if this were all there were to him, I personally wouldn't take him terribly seriously. He does say that despair can be defined as the wrong relationship to God. Well, of course, if you say that, then you can say that almost all men are the, in the wrong relationship to God, although they don't know it. There's no paradox about that. But then why call that despair? That's arbitrary, to save a paradox by redefining the terms. But Kierkegaard also says something much more interesting to my mind in the same book, namely that despair means being in a wrong relation to oneself. And might it not be the case that almost all men are in the wrong relationship to themselves, although they don't know it? That makes a lot of sense, and we can specify what this wrong relationship to themselves is. They are running away from themselves. They are trying to escape from themselves. And this surely is a profound analysis of modern man, and we can leave open the possibility that perhaps it's a profound analysis not only of modern man, possibly of men at all times. And Kierkegaard would say further that philosophy and science and society all help men to escape from themselves, all help men to run away from themselves. Men are afraid of being alone with themselves because they might encounter themselves. They're afraid of solitude. As Kierkegaard once puts it, they can't think of any better use for solitude than as a horrible punishment. So they seek togetherness. They seek community activities and the churches help them. The churches become great centers for community activities. The churches help men to escape from themselves. Here I think we have point number one that's eminently worthwhile. Point number two is that he is against Hegel's dictum that our society is the freest that ever existed and that what we should do is absorb its values and conform and believe in progress and be proud of our achievements. But surely that wasn't just the view of Hegel, that's the view of almost all our secondary school teachers in the United States today. <laughs> And Kierkegaard says that this is a terrible view, that we should realize that this optimism is unfounded, that the, the true individual, the person who takes problems seriously, is in despair. His problems are not solved by science and society, and what you should do is not conform and not absorb the values of your society, but stand alone. That's point number two. And third and last, Kierkegaard's criticism of liberal Christianity and perhaps of liberal religion quite generally bears thinking about. And his interpretation of Christianity as deeply authoritarian, although perhaps not very appealing to the 20th century mind, might well be historically more correct than the more appealing interpretations to which we are accustomed today. When Kierkegaard says that Christianity is authoritarian, I think he is right. But he is also right when he says that Christianity teaches us to leave father and mother and to stand alone. That the original teaching of Jesus is not that the family that prays together stays together, but quite to the contrary, that you should not pray together, but that you should shut the door and pray by yourself. Here Kierkegaard speaks as a true heir, not just of Jesus, but perhaps of the prophets too. Let me end with a final dig against a very popular contrast today, with which probably most of you are familiar.
that between the good guys and the bad guys, the authoritarians and the humanists, we classify people and the authoritarians are the bad guys, and Kierkegaard clearly was authoritarian, you can quote him along that line again and again, and the humanists, they have the good beliefs. One thing that I will try to get across in all of these lectures, and quite emphatically today in the first one, is that one can learn a great deal from people who were authoritarian, and that Kierkegaard was one of them. We must not say people are black and white, let's first see whether they are on the right side, and if they were, we will learn from them. But we may find that people who outrage us and to embarrass us and to annoy us and with whom we differ may be among the people from whom we have the most to learn. And that's one reason why I'm devoting these three lectures to three very outrageous people. Now, let's have questions. Please speak loudly enough that not only I can hear you, but other people too. Um, before I came here tonight, I If I understand the question right, you found somewhere that existentialism was defined as the belief that one just goes from crisis to crisis. I don't think that would be a very good definition of existentialism. This is not a point on which the people who are chiefly called existentialists have taken any particular stand. But you might say, and this is what I did try to say, that existentialists, instead of emphasizing what is ordinary and usual in life, emphasize the crises and so give the impression that life consists very largely of crises. Between what? Oh. I must confess that I have not read Miss Rand's novels, but I understand that she is a great admirer of Nietzsche's, and so, if so, there probably is some connection, though obviously one should not read all of her ideas back into Nietzsche, and either give him credit for them or blame him for them. He very clearly did attack uh, liberal and reformed religions. Now what his attitude toward various forms of orthodoxy would be is a little bit difficult to say. One extraordinary thing I think about Kierkegaard is that he did not address himself to religions other than his own. That for example he never even writes about Calvinism. He treats Calvinism as non-existent. He does not discuss the Roman Catholic Church, much less does he discuss Orthodox Judaism, that by temperament he would have some feeling for orthodoxy that he wouldn't have for liberalism is clear, I think. But whether he would particularly applaud any such positions, I am not sure, because one thing that's very clear in Kierkegaard is that he does not share the admiration for organized religion as such, or for a deep religious faith, whatever that may be, that's so fashionable today, but he wants a particular interpretation of Christianity, and anything that doesn't agree with that, he rejects. I think the answer is no, but the answer is also that it would, that this is not a terribly relevant objection. Perhaps one doesn't have to worry about that too much.
Yes, but I think uh, we, we haven't come to Sart yet. We've talked about Kierkegaard today, and I think it would be fair to say that Kierkegaard is not too terribly worried any more than I should think Jesus was, and Kierkegaard is a Christian, he is not too terribly worried about whether mankind will survive or whether it will not survive. What he is worried about is the other world, is going to heaven. And what he concerns himself with, in line with a tradition that is strong in Christianity, and by no means totally absent from Judaism either. What he concerns himself with is what you might call the remnant, the exceptional individuals. Now I'm not trying to say that you should accept this. There's something, as I've tried to bring out, deeply undemocratic about his whole attitude. He is not concerned about the greatest possible happiness of the greatest possible number. Not at all. What he is concerned with is how a man might become a good Christian, or if you want to put it differently, what the individual might have to do in order to be saved when he dies. This is something that's puzzling in many a reformer, that he revolts against the church, but then may add, and this is Kierkegaard's line clearly, that he revolts against it in part because it isn't authoritarian enough. So it's easy to sympathize with him because of his individualism, but you might say, if ever you got your way, if ever you got your will, what would happen to people like you? It's a similar feeling, just first of all by way of bringing out that this problem isn't confined to Kierkegaard, that one might have, for example, about a man like Plato, who criticizes the society that he lives in, Athenian democracy, because it isn't authoritarian enough, and he is a great rebel and a great individualist and a great iconoclast and a great critic, but what he would like to have is the kind of society in which people like he would have no place at all. Now we have something similar to that very clearly in Kierkegaard. And I think what he would say is that certain kinds of belief should be insisted on by the church and that there should not be any leeway when it comes to whether you do or don't accept central dogmas about Christ, but that of course the individual might have some leeway in having some deep experience. What he objects to is a religion in which deep experience is something that would be an embarrassment, in which deep experience would almost disqualify anybody from membership because it just wouldn't be long because it would be so extraordinary and exceptional. The deep experience is compatible, I should think, with a more authoritarian setup. Perhaps I can draw an analogy here which will be familiar to some of you, and that would be that perhaps in Orthodox Judaism, in religious services, you would be much more likely to see many people seized by stark religious experience than you would in more liberal services. And perhaps you would find the same sort of thing also between fundamentalist Protestant services and liberal services. The deepness and the intensity of the experience is compatible with a good deal of traditionalism and orthodoxy.
think that this is particularly frightful rather than being something that in any way can reconcile one to Kierkegaard. I think that with a strangely and disturbingly prophetic soul, he rightly sees that his night of faith is not a fanatic with fire and sword, but the man who is willing to commit atrocities with a firm faith that everything will come out all right and who, to be drastic about it, comes back, say, from his uh, having liquidated a few million people to his family and is a very nice father and a very nice husband and, as Kierkegaard puts it, to quote him, in ordinary life you can't tell him from a tax collector. I think he is dead right about this, and I find it deeply disturbing, but most people are too romantic and too dramatic about it. They think that people who commit deeds like that must be obviously monsters, as if they sort of must have horns and tail. But Kierkegaard sees quite rightly that if a man has the firm faith that what he is doing is all right, and that in the end it will all be for the best, even though if you argue with him, he'll have to admit that it's absurd, how could it come out for the best, still he believes somehow it will, then he can afterwards go back to his family and be quite undisturbed. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. But a man like Kierkegaard wistfully deplores his own rationality, his own integrity, his own conscience, saying, if I did a thing like that, I would not be able to go back. And instead of saying, that's because I am too decent a man, he says, that's because I don't have the kind of faith that one ought to have. At this point, obviously, I don't agree with him at all, and I don't suppose any of you had the idea in the first place during my lecture that I am in any sense a follower of Kierkegaard, even though I tried to give a sympathetic interpretation. What explains the today is that Kierkegaard has found among so many people today who really disagree with him. Imagine it's so contrary to the spirit of modern time. Because it's much more fascinating to deal with somebody who deals with interesting problems that have some relation to one's own life than to read about things that strike one as wholly academic and irrelevant to one's own life. I think that's the main reason. A secondary reason is that he wrote well, and a tertiary reason is that there are some psychological insights that sort of spice the reading. There was a lady a little to the left there. Kierkegaard thought, and at this point I find him impossible to follow, he thought that the only way to transcend this despair was by being a good Christian. At this point I simply cannot follow, this doesn't make any sense to me at all. First of all you might say, well, uh, Let's be a little bit more broad-minded. What about being a Jew? Or what about being a Buddhist? Couldn't one transcend it in that way too? Or one might ask, what about being the kind of man, let's say, that we will come across as we consider Nietzsche and Sartre, or familiar to some of you from Camus' novels? Might it not be possible without any religious faith? I think here Kierkegaard doesn't argue, but is just dogmatic. And to me, at this point, he isn't plausible at all. I can take just one more short question. Uh, 
don't see why the Orthodox Church, why a church that would measure up to Kierkegaard's expectations, would have to condemn Abraham. What Kierkegaard is saying, in effect, is the parson is a hypocrite if he praises Abraham Sunday morning, but Sunday afternoon, if a member of his congregation should go out to do likewise, but try to stop him. But now, why couldn't somebody first preach faith, and then if people also have got it, cheer them for it and be happy about it? I would say that the dreadful thing at this point is that the church so often has done again just what Kierkegaard wanted it to do, that people have preached to other people to go out and burn other people at the stake and kill other people and then have not stopped them either but quite consistently allowed them to go ahead with that. You're entirely right that according to Kierkegaard, Abram couldn't communicate it, but the parson might do what Kierkegaard says he would do, just reverently stand back and say, here is a great man, here is the kind of man who resembles Abraham, let's canonize him. On that note, let's close for today.